Our Father, please be with us now. Please, Lord, help me. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk to you from Mark chapter 7. We've been just making our way through Mark. It took us a while to get through Mark chapter 6. Finally got through it. Now we're on Mark 7. And uh, the title of my sermon is Altar Calls and, De- and the Death Penalty. Altar Calls and the Death Penalty. But before we get into the actual sermon, a couple points I want to hit on. Let me just give you kind of bring you up to speed where we're at here. Jesus gets an audit from the religious leaders. Some investigators come from headquarters in D.C., I mean Jerusalem, and they come to check him out. <clears throat> and they don't, these investigators don't like what they see, okay? They're trying to find some little law to accuse Jesus of breaking, some little T he hasn't crossed, some little I he hasn't dotted. They're sweating small stuff, okay? Similar to how the IRS targets conservative groups. Now, even when we see that happening today, this is kind of the same stuff Jesus was dealing with in this crowd. Now, Jesus nor his disciples were breaking any type of biblical laws here. But what they were doing was they were not adhering to these man-made traditions of the elders. These elders, these religious leaders had this tradition that when they would, anytime they would come from the market, I guess because they were exposed to a lot of people, all right, so they were worried about getting a lot of germs and stuff, They would not eat unless they performed some type of OCD kind of ceremonial washings, right? Just, you know, how some OCD, you know, how germaphobes can be kind of OCD about some things. You know, they were washing of their hands or cups. Now, I mean, don't get me wrong. I think we should wash our hands before we eat, before we use the restroom. That's just good home training. But these people were taking it, going overboard with it. Well, I had to wash cups, pots, vessels, and even the table, they were probably, they were doing some type of ceremonial cleansing, okay? It was probably sprinkling it with holy water or something. No real purpose at all. Just a total religious show, all right, is what, what was going on here. I doubt the disciples had dirty hands. They just had not done these ceremonial cleansings. And it, it, they were being attacked or criticized by these Pharisees and scribes. <clears throat> Jesus and his disciples are making it clear right off the bat that they don't want to have anything to do with this man-made religiosity. All right, they, want, they want nothing to do with it. That's why they're not participating in it. That would be similar uh, to us today. You know, we don't want anything to do with counting of rosary beads and hell Mary full of grace running around a pillowcase, hit them high, hit them low, go Mary go. <laughs> You know, all the wearing of long robes and swinging of smoke in people's faces and infant baptism, <laughs> confessing your sins to some pervert in a phone booth. You know, we just lighting candles, praying to saints, all these man-made traditions and rituals that have zero basis in the Word of God. You know, Jesus is distancing himself from that kind of nonsense, and, you know, we don't want to be tied up with it. You know, for the longest time, I, I just, I hated being called religious because I didn't even want to be associated with any of that kind of nonsense. But, you know, religion doesn't bother me if you want to call me religious as long as you're talking about the old-time religion, amen? Because the old-time religion, we don't do any of that man-made type of traditions and rituals. All right, but look at verse 6. In verse 6, we start seeing Jesus' hairiness come out. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you have to listen to two Sundays ago, Jesus was a hairy man. Uh, Jesus was a non-smooth preacher. You have to listen to that message I preached about Jesus' hairiness. He was non-smooth. Look at verse 6. He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied, talking about Isaiah here, of you hypocrites, that's how, you, that's how they wrote it in, uh, in uh, Greek for the New Testament. <clears throat> well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as, is, as it is written, the people honoreth me with their lips, but the heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So they were teaching commandments of men as if they were biblical doctrines, as if they were actual commandments of God. They weren't. They were just commandments of men. That's a danger. It's a danger to teach anything that is a commandment of man and make it equivalent to be a commandment of God. That's very dangerous. Look, uh, look at verse 8. For laying aside the commandment of God. Now underline commandment of God in your Bible. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things you do. And he said unto them, Full well you reject 
the commandment of God. The second time he's accusing them of rejecting God's commandments that you may keep your own tradition. Now, Jesus is scolding them for being hypocrites and keeping man-made traditions to appear holy instead of actually honoring God and keeping God's commandments. So we're going to come back at the end and talk about what commandment this is that Jesus is bringing up. But just as as Jesus accused these uh, religious leaders, uh, Isaiah did this of being hypocrites and honoring, not wanting to truly honor God with their hearts, but just an outward show, Isaiah accused the religious leaders of his day of the same thing. Now, it's very important, I want you to notice again in verse 8 and verse 9, that Jesus refers back to the fact that they rejected God's law for man's law. Anytime Jesus does that, he, he brought this up twice. You've rejected God's commandment for man's tradition. He said it, he hit him, he hit him on that twice. That's very important, and we're going to get to that in the end. But look down at verse 10, and let me help you understand the big picture here before we flesh this verse out. I want to try to help you understand what the big picture is, what, what's going on here. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whosoever curseth thy father or mother, let him die the death. All right, the first thing I want you to understand when it says, Whoso curseth father or mother, let him die. It didn't say cusseth. It says curseth. When you curse somebody, that means you want to do harm to them. You want to put a curse on them, you want to harm them. All right, so this is an individual who, who God's saying, Honor thy father and mother, and whosoever curseth, whoever wants to do the father and mother harm, shall be put to death. All right, that's what he's saying. Now, does it sound like Jesus is against the death penalty or for the death penalty? For it, amen? And I'll get to that here in a little bit. Verse 11 says, But ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, It is Corban, that is to say a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which you have delivered, and many such like things do ye. Now hold your place there in Mark and turn over to Matthew chapter 3. I think this will help you understand what this whole Corban thing is all about. Corban, Corban, however you want to say it. Verse 11, while you're turning there, let me tell you this. Verse 11 specifically says that a Corban is something that's been designated as a gift. I want us to see and help us to understand what's the big picture here, what's going on here. What is this thing? Why is Jesus so upset about this Corban thing, this gift thing? So look at Matthew 23, verse 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses. Now, underline that in your Bible. You devour widows' houses. And for a pretense, make long prayer. Therefore, you shall receive the greater damnation. Now, Jesus is specifically addressing the same type of Pharisees, same type of scribes, religious leaders that are in charge. He's addressing the same type of person in 23, Matthew 23, as we saw back in Mark chapter 7. Now, Mark chapter 7 gives us, or uh, Matthew here gives us a little more detail on what's going on. And Matthew chapter 23 gives us a little more detail on what's going on. Verse 23, or, or verse 14 of 23, we see that they're devouring widows' houses. All right? So let's see how they're doing that. Look at, jump down to verse 18, Matthew 23, verse 18. And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing, but whosoever swear by the gift, that is upon it, he is guilty. Now here we see this gift thing again. You remember what Corban is? Corban was a gift. The same context of this gift again being placed at the altar, we also see the context of devouring widows' houses. All right, now I don't understand all these details here. I'm not going to stand here and try to act like I understand and got all this thing figured out. But I'm just going to tell you what, it seemed, it, what, what, I, what my opinion is, what's going on here. It seems to me as if the Pharisees are scribes who were the teachers and enforcers of the law. They're kind of like, would be kind of like, you know, think how we would think of a government official, if you would. They were basically taking these bribes in the form of a gift that people would bring to the altar. So if somebody would bring a gift to the altar, the Pharisees would receive it, the scribes would receive it, and in return, 
They would take it as a bribe, and as a result of that, widows' houses would be devoured. Because whoever brought that gift, now the Pharisees and scribes would let that person be off the hook for their biblical responsibility of providing for their family members, the widow. I don't know if that you understand that. I'll explain it here in a little bit again. I'll, I'll give it. I'll explain it one more time. Let me just. These gifts or bribes were causing widows' houses to be devoured by allowing people to not have to fulfill their responsibility to honor or financially support their parents. See, if you study that whole thing about how we're supposed to honor a mother and father, that term honor has a financial connection to it. That's not just talking about respect, mother and father, uh, you know, have respect and honor for mother and father. That's talking about we actually have a responsibility to financially support our parents when they get older, if they can't financially take care of themselves. Let me prove that to you. The Bible says to let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Then it says the laborer is worthy of his reward. That honor there is a financial reward. Anytime you see honor in the Bible, it, a lot of times it has to do with financial, a financial element to it. So not only honor our parents by respecting them, we're supposed to financially honor our parents because they birthed us, they raised us, they put up with us, they changed our diapers for us. Our mothers went to the jaws of death for us. And, you know, we're supposed to return a favor. That's God's social security system. All right? God doesn't believe it dropping people off at nursing homes. All right? Thank God for Miss Roxanne. She manages a nursing home, you know, because some people, you know, don't have any family to take care of them. So, I mean, I realize there is a need for that type of situation. The church is supposed to be the one doing that anyway, but I know I realize there is a need for that in our society, but God's plan is for us to take care of our parents when they get older. Uh, listen to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 16. If any man or woman that believeth have widows... Let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. We're supposed to take care of our family, all right? So the church can take care of those who don't have any family. If someone had a widow, widowed relative, they were supposed to take care of them so the church could take care of the ones who had no family to support. Now let me explain to you my theory what's going on here. I said all that so you would understand what the big picture here is. Why Jesus is so angry and, and, and uh, about this Corban, this gift thing. And my theory of what's going on here is somebody would say, Sorry, Mama. I know I'm supposed to support you, Mama. I know I'm supposed to take care of you, Mama. You took care of me for 20 years. And now I know I'm supposed to take care of you for the last 15, 20 years of your life. But I'm sorry, Mama. I'm greedy, and I would rather spend my money on myself instead of give my money to you. So what I'm going to do is, see this money right here, Mama, that was supposed to go for you? See this financial support, Mama, here that was supposed to go for you, to provide for you? You know what? I'm going to, make, I'm going to designate this as a gift. I'm going to give it to the church. I'm going to give it to the church. because I'm going to designate it as, as, as Corban. It's a gift. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it and put it at the altar. And now this Pharisee or this scribe takes it as a gift and takes it for his own financial mean, for his own financial gain. And now he lets me off the hook for having to provide for my family in the future. Or maybe I kept half for myself and gave half to the church. I don't, I got, I don't have it all figured out how it all worked. But... He would take it for his, his benefit and let me off the hook some way. And now that mother would be at the mercy of the temple, their welfare program. So it'd be like, you know, me, instead of having my mother here in the comfort of my home where I provide for her, 
now she's down at the nursing home, you know, at their mercy. God knows what kind of care she's getting down there. And I do know there's some good nursing homes, but I, have, I know there's some bad ones, too, where there are abu- a lot of elderly people are abused. All right, so I think that's what's going on here. Uh, Mama, this, this money's been designated as a gift. It's Corban. I don't have the financial means to help you anymore. Sorry, but now you're at the mercy of the temple to get whatever support you can get from them. The Pharisees and scribes would accept this gift and they let the giver off the hook or not suffer that family member to fulfill their biblical role to provide honor for their parents. Now, let's keep that in mind, what I just explained to you, and let's look at that verse one more time and see if that makes sense. Let's go back to verse 11, Mark chapter 7, verse 11. Let's reread it, see if it makes sense. But ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corban, that is to say a gift, by whatsoever thou mayest be profited by me. So the religious leaders are benefiting or profiting from this gift in the name of the Lord. So you see now how these religious leaders are benefiting uh, from this gift in the name of the Lord. And as a result, look what it says, he shall be free. So as a result, he's free from his responsibilities to provide and care for his family. Verse 12 says, And you suffer him no more to do aught for his father and mother. mother. See, they, they were in a position of authority, these scribes and Pharisees, where they could actually require you to do something. Or you'd be punished for it. So it says here, once they receive this gift, it says they don't suffer him no more. They don't require him anymore to do provide that financial uh, Support to his mother and father. That's what makes sense to me. That's how I interpret this. I may be off somewhere, but I think that's pretty close. Uh, So now let's move on to verse 15. So does that make sense? All right. Let's move on to verse 15. Jesus is 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 Jesus is reprimanding or reprimanding them. He's he's rebuking them for not actually requiring people to honor their mother and their father. They're holding their traditions of of the elders. All right, verse 15, and I'll come back at the end and talk about that a little bit more. But verse 15, we see Jesus is going back, and he's addressing what it is that actually defiles a person. Remember, they were all wrapped up around the axle about these ceremonial washings, thought that, you know, if they ate with, ceremonial unclean hands or ceremonial unclean vessels that they would actually defile themselves. So Jesus is going back and addressing that. He's actually going to talk about what actually defiles a person. He wants to make it clear that eating with unwashed hands or unwashed vessels will not defile you. You know that kind of bacteria that you might catch from a cup that hadn't been thoroughly cleaned? It's, It's not going to defile you because, look, it doesn't go into your heart. It goes into your stomach, and it's digested. It's purged with stomach acids, and, you know, it's digested. So he says that which comes out of a person is that which defiles and makes them unclean. Because that which comes out of a person is, in their, is what's in their heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Okay, what's in your heart is what makes us defiled before Jesus Christ. That's why the Bible says, uh, you know... All our righteousness is is an unclean thing. You know, I just heard, and I was was going through Isaiah this week, and Isaiah, uh, God God was telling Isaiah, he'll cast them off like a mistress rag. That's what our righteousness is before God is, is a mistress rag. You put all your good deeds and your righteousness, and you try to merit heaven or try to work your way into heaven, where is but a filthy rag. Okay, and that's because our hearts are wickedly deceitful. And apart from the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit, we're all unclean. It's what's in our heart that defiles us, that comes out of us, because it's in us. It's not what we put in our stomach that makes us, that defiles us. Now, after Jesus finishes teaching, right after he finishes teaching this, he travels the right good ways to the border of two distant cities. And he wanted to stay on a down low for a little while. He wanted to hide out, the Bible says. 
probably just needed to get a little break so we, uh, and just to re- relax a little bit. We know Jesus got tired, just like we get tired. But also, I believe he wanted to stay on the down low and he wanted to hide out for a spell well, so as not overwhelmed with charity cases and the healing lines. All right, because remember, Jesus' primary purpose was for spiritual healing and not physical healing. And you can imagine how overwhelming it must have been for his disciples and just all the charity cases and the people wanting to be physically healed. Now, Matthew chapter 15 tells us this Greek woman hunts Jesus down. This Greek woman finds him, she hunts him down. She's talking to Jesus, wanting Jesus to heal her daughter who's possessed with a devil, but Jesus is kind of ignoring her. I guess he's ignoring her because he just wants to see how persistent she's going to be, how serious she is. But she can tell she's not really getting anywhere with Jesus. I guess you like to say he's testing her persistency. So she goes and cries to the disciples, and it's just having the disciples crying to him and crying to him and aggravating him. So finally, the disciples just go to Jesus and they say, Look, please cast this devil out of this woman. She's aggravating us. Heal her daughter and let her move on down the street. We're sick of hearing her. We're sick of hearing her. All right? Please take care of this woman and send her away. She's cry- her crying is aggravating us. Now look at verse 27. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children be filled, for it is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it unto the dogs. And she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And he said unto her, For this saying, Go thy way, that the devil is gone out of the daughter. Now turn to chapter, Matthew chapter 15, verse 23. Matthew chapter 15, verse 23. This will help us understand what's going on here. I've read a lot. There's, I've heard a lot of confusion over the years about this one passage of Scripture here. Now let me be clear that Jesus is not actually calling this woman a dog. He's not referring to this woman as an actual dog like a filthy outdoor scavenger or something like that. Because we know in the Bible, this woman's not a sodomite. All right? We know in the Bible there's a term reserved for sodomites, and it's a dog. They're called that in the Old Testament. They're called that in the New Testament. Sodomites are referred to as dogs. And if Jesus was referring to this woman as a dog, if she was a sodomite, then he'd be violating his own command to give not that which is holy to dogs. All right? He'd be violating his own command. Give not that which is holy to dogs. And we have a dog for each church, by the way. We will always have a sodomite for each church. Because I was thinking this, this afternoon, man, we got kids all over the place. Kids running around all over the place. And for the safety of our church and for our safety of our children, we will always be dog free. We'll always be sodomite free. Okay? But <clears throat> I believe Jesus was not calling this woman a dog. Uh, like a, a, a sodomite dog or anything. What Jesus was saying was, he was just, he was, use, he was using a parable to il- illustrate a point. I believe what Jesus was saying was that she was acting like a little aggravate, aggravating little house puppy under the table, begging for crumbs. I mean, you think about how a little puppy just sits there and begs under the table and just aggravating, aggravating, aggravating. This woman was, was aggravating the disciples. She, kept, she was crying and crying and crying to the point where they were like, send her away. So she was being aggravated. She was aggravating like a little puppy. And uh, Jesus' focus at that time was on the children. He uses a parable about how the, the bread is for the children, not the, the dogs underneath the table. So at this point in time in Jesus' ministry, his focus was on the children. His focus was on the lost sheep of the house of Israel, all right? And that's what Jesus was saying here. <clears throat> Israel at that current time was being pictured as the children. Jesus said, let the children be filled first. All right, let the children be filled first. Now turn to Matthew chapter 15, verse 23, and I'll prove to you that Jesus, what Jesus is saying here is, look, my focus right now is on the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 15, 23, but he answered her not a word, and this is just the same event, just another gospel with a little more detail. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. 
But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep, the house of Israel. Our Jesus is telling her, look, my focus isn't on you right now. My focus, not saying she couldn't be saved right then. It's just Jesus' focus at that point in time in his ministry was on the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But guess what? She didn't care. She was persistent. She didn't care what Jesus' focus was on. She wanted a crumb. She'd take anything she could get. And as a result of her fervency, Jesus answered her request. Now, this is a beautiful picture of a great picture of how we should pray. Picture, you know, the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We can change God's mind. You know, there's this Calvinism and all this kind of stuff that say, oh, we just pray because we want to conform our lives to God's will. No, I pray because I want to change God's mind and I want to get God's blessing and I want God to... Decide in my favor. I mean, think about how long David prayed for his son to uh, his child he had with Bathsheba to be healed. David was praying, asking for God, change God's mind and have mercy on him. God said no. And David said okay. He got up and went on about his business when the child died. But, you know, the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And we need to pray and we try to change God's mind. Hezekiah changed God's mind. I, what he, I mean, was it 10 or 15 years he got added to his life? 15 years. Now, <clears throat> I'd like to go back and hit on two points from this chapter. Now, hopefully, I wanted to kind of clear some things up that maybe were hard for you to understand in that chapter. Now, I want to go back and hit on two main points in this chapter here. Number one, I want to talk to you about this idea of the doctrines of men. Now, look at verse 7. Howbeit in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. This is something that we need to be very careful of. We can have our preferences. It's okay to say, okay, this is my opinion. This is how I want to do things. But we need to be careful to not say that one of our preferences or one of our opinions is a doctrine from the Word of God. Now, independent Baptists are pretty good about avoiding man-made tr- Traditions and rituals that have no basis from the Word of God. They're pretty good about it. But I'll tell you one that independent Baptists do push a lot that's not a doctrine, and it's not even, it, 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 they, I'm sorry, they push it as a biblical doctrine, but it's not, it's not biblical at all. And I'm not trying to attack it. I'm, I'm not saying it's wrong if you do it. Just don't say that it's a biblical doctrine, or don't say that you're not right with God, or or if you don't participate in it or, or do it at your church, it's this idea of the altar call. The altar call. Now, the first churches that I've been a member of all practice this, and I'm not attacking anybody. I'm not being critical. I, you know, of, of, of churches that have altar calls, I thank God for the decision. I've made a lot of life-changing decisions at an altar. You know, and I, I've, I've participated in thousands of altar calls. And I'm, I'm so thankful for all the people that have been saved in an altar. I'm not saying it's sinful. The only way I'm saying sinful is if you actually teach it as a biblical doctrine or or, or degrade people for not participating in a non-biblical practice. That's what I think we need to be careful of. You know, and I personally used to be, at one point in time, I was very critical of churches that I visited that did not do an invitation. I was very critical and very vocal about it. But my problem was not... My main problem was they didn't do an invitation, period. All right? They didn't invite people to get saved, visitors to get saved at all. It wasn't necessarily that they didn't do a public invitation. It's just they didn't have, they didn't invite visitors to get saved at all. So that was my main problem. I don't think I would have been critical of them not doing a public invitation if they'd at least done a private invitation. And that's what we do here at Old Path Baptist Church. We do a private invitation, and I'll get more on that in a minute. Over the past 20 years, I've visited a lot of churches, and I've come to the conclusion that a private invitation is what I believe is the most biblical way and is the correct way to do it. Again, I'm not trying to knock somebody who doesn't do it, or doesn't do it the way I do. You know, I have no... if, if If I... I had no problem being a member of a church... This is not a deal breaker. This is not a big deal. All right? A lot, of, a lot of people want to look for every little stinking excuse to not be a member of a church. 
This is not a big deal, all right? It's, it's not a deal breaker. So, you know, people want to say, oh, I can't go to this church because it's not pre-trib or because or, it's pre-trib or I can't go to this church because it's a, they, they, they believe in Zionism. You know, I can't go to this church because they have a public altar call. And it's, not, it's not a deal breaker. It's not, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want to send a wrong message here. But I'm just going to give you a few reasons why I'll, 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 we'll, we'll, uh, la, la, la. I'm going to give you a few reasons here why we will never do a public invitation. Number one, it's awkward for visitors. Now, think about it. What's the purpose of doing an invitation? To get people saved, right? If the purpose of doing an invitation is to get people saved, do you think it's easier to get somebody saved in the front of the whole church with a lot of people gawking at them and staring at them? Or is it easier to get somebody saved off to the side one-on-one? All right. <clears throat> Now, I personally would rather take them off somewhere where they're unpressured, no piano playing, I'm trying to talk over piano, no preacher talking over you, giving the invitation. I'm not being rushed as a soul winner to finish up for the last stanza of Just As I Am. You know, <clears throat> I, I would personally rather just take them off to the side and, and get it done the right way. I, I believe I, it's, it's more liberty this way. Now, I worked in an altar for around six years at, 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 for, at, uh, at my last church. I worked, in all, I worked at the altar for uh, six years. And for the last several years of it, and even though I didn't necessarily believe in a public uh, invitation, even though I didn't necessarily believe that was the best way to do it, I did it because my pastor asked me to. And I wanted to be respectful of my pastor, and I wanted to do what he asked me to do. So even though I didn't necessarily, you know, believe that was the most effective way, I did what my pastor wanted me to do. Um, and I helped him out. Now, again, like I said, the, fact, the last several years, I actually led more people to the Lord by going to them and kind of doing my own little private invitation. I would stand there and wait for people to come forward, and I would see visitors in the, in the uh, audience. And if nobody came to me, I would take it upon myself to go to them, and I would shake, my, shake their hand and say, man, I'm so glad you came this morning. My name's Brother Manley. Thank you so much for coming. I try to ask all our visitors this very important question. Sir, God forbid, but if you died today, are you 100% sure you'd be going to heaven? A lot of times, you know, they would say, well, no, I'm not. Well, would you like for me to show you too? You mind if I show you from the Bible how you can be for sure you're going to heaven? And I would take the time and I, I, would, I would go through the Bible with them. And I actually, the last several years I was there at my church, I led more people to the Lord. And I, that's kind of how I came to believe what I believe today about that is the most effective way. Because they would, I'd have a lot more success going to them than hoping they would come to me. All right, Because a lot of times they're just too nervous and embarrassed and shy to walk up in front of a whole group of people. All right? <clears throat> Now, I think about when I first went to, started going, when I first got plugged into church, I grew up in a very liberal Southern Baptist church. They had an, altar, an invitation basically to come join the church. I don't ever remember seeing anybody come forward in like 18 years, maybe once or twice. But then I started going to church with my wife, and she invited me to, to church, old-fashioned, hellfire and brimstone, fundamental Baptist church. And, uh, you know, they gave an altar call. I was saved. I didn't have assurance of my salvation at the time. So, looking back, I, I do believe I was saved, but at the time, I didn't know it. I think I was saved. I wouldn't have wanted to die and find out for sure. <laughs> but, but, but I do believe I was saved, and I didn't really have assurance of my salvation, but I didn't really know I was saved. You know, I had called on the Lord. I had believed on the Lord, but I was living such a wicked life. There was no, you know, no change at all. I was just... Never got discipled, never got plugged in. And the reason why I say I was saved is because I wasn't able to enjoy my sin anymore. I was convicted and I was miserable for doing the same things I used to enjoy. All right, but I came to church with Crystal and they had an altar call. And I was convicted. I wanted to go up front and I wanted to surrender my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. But I was too nervous. I mean, this is probably about eight, 900 people in this church. And I was too nervous to go up front. I, I didn't know what it was all about. It was just, I didn't, didn't understand it all. 
And I was just too scared to go up front, so I didn't go up front. And these pastors, another thing I have a problem with these altar calls is most of these pastors are totally dependent upon that. If you don't come to the altar call, then I guess they weren't ready to get saved. Well, if somebody would approach me privately one-on-one, I probably would have got assurance of my salvation. So God forbid if I, and, and uh, the week later, I actually did go forward and I actually did surrender my life to the Lord Jesus Christ and I did get assurance of my salvation. But just think what would have happened in that week's time if I would have died. You know, I, I think I was saved, but like I said, I didn't have assurance of my salvation, so I don't know for 100% for sure. All right, so, I mean, that week's a long time. A lot can happen in a week, all right? So if somebody would have came up to me at the end of that service, then I probably wouldn't have had to wait a whole week to get assurance of my salvation. I probably would have gotten right with God right then and there. All right? And I've heard people say a lot, well, if you're not ready to go up front to everybody, then I guess you're not ready to be saved. I could tell you a preacher right now who I respect and look up to, and I'm not going to call his name because we're all wrong on something. You know, we all say things. That, and I don't know if he still believes this or not. But a preacher that I love to listen to when he actually puts his stuff on the internet, he took his stuff off the internet. He guess he's running scared, but uh, he said, he said this. He said, "Well, if you're not ready to go in front of everybody, then I guess you're not ready to be saved." And the problem with that is, show me that in the Bible. What you're doing is you're adding a step to salvation. I thought all you had to do was believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Where does it say you have to be willing to go up in front of a group of people? So you're adding a step to salvation and you're muddying the waters of the gospel and they need to be crystal clear at all times. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Amen? Now, I remember one Sunday morning, in the, it's been in the past year, I was working the altar for my pastor like I did every Sunday morning. There was a 22-year-old boy and his sister visiting. And let me say this, my pastor did an awesome job doing an invitation. If I had to do one, I, was, I would do one like he does it. He does a phenomenal job. I like the way he did it, the best I'd ever seen. And, you know, all the years of growing up and being in church, the best I'd ever seen. Very clear, very easy to understand. But this boy and girl sat through the entire invitation and never raised their hand. You know, he, he would ask the question, you know, if you're not 100% sure if you die today, you go going to have, please raise your hand. I'd like to pray for you. He didn't raise their hand. I'm watching him. They didn't raise their hand. So after he did the invitation, or at, when he started the invitation, nobody came to me to see me. We had, we'd have four or five people up there, you know, and have two or three guys and two or three ladies to talk to ladies. Nobody came to me, so I went to them. All right, I went over to them, and I said, same thing I just told you. I always say, thank you all so much for coming. I try to ask all our, vis our visitors the same question. This is what he told me. He said, well, I feel like I would. After he had sat through that whole service, after he had heard my pastor's salvation presentation, probably about 10 minutes he took at the end to give a salvation presentation, it's not my pastor's fault. He couldn't have been any clearer. He still told me this. He still told me, I feel like I would. I said, okay, well, what do you believe a person has to do to go to heaven? Be true to yourself and be worthy. Wow, man. I said, I'm in big trouble because I'm not worthy. You know, and I actually said, well, would you like for me to take the Bible and show you how you can overshare? And I took the Bible and led both of those people to the Lord. It just goes to show you that one-on-one -on -one is the best way because you can gauge if they're understanding it or not. You know, you, you can see if they're receiving it and understand. I always ask, do you, agree, do you agree with me that if I got what I deserved, I'd have to go to hell and pay for my sins? Do you agree with me that it's a free gift? Do you agree with me that once you receive this gift, it lasts forever? Before I move on to the next point, in my salvation plan, I always make sure you understand it and are receiving it before I move on to the next point. That's another, you can't do that when you're at the pulpit, okay? Uh, that's why I like one-on-one. -on -one. Now, a lot of pastors are totally dependent on an invitation, but sometimes people don't, they didn't respond to it. So what would happen if I hadn't approached them? If I hadn't approached them, they probably wouldn't be saved today, all right? <clears throat> Number two, let me give you the second reason why I will never do a, a public invitation. It is not allow enough time to adequately go through the gospel and get someone saved. I can't tell you the amount of times that I've seen people 
that were supposedly led to the Lord, you know, two or three weeks ago. I'm working the altar, and they're continuously raising their hand. Pastor. Pastor says, uh, you know, is there anybody here who's not 100% sure if they die today, would you be going to heaven? It's like, man, I just saw somebody pray with that person two weeks ago. I've seen people raise their hand every Sunday and have to make five or six trips down to the altar and still don't have assurance of their salvation. And I believe the reason why that is, they're constantly raising their hand, they're constantly uh, never having a reassurance of their salvation, is because the gospel wasn't adequately explained to them. It's hard to go through the complete gospel when, you, like I say, you're trying to finish before the third stanza of Just As I Am is finished. All right, see, just calling on the name of the Lord is not enough if you're also trying to work for it. Just calling on the name of Jesus isn't enough. Just asking Jesus Christ into your heart is not enough if you also think you're having to work, you're trying to work your way to heaven. Or if you think you could lose your salvation. All right, that's not going to get the job done. Just asking Jesus into your heart or just calling on the name of the Lord is not going to get the job done if they don't know that it's a free gift and it lasts forever. All right? <clears throat> Jesus emphasized three things to the woman at the well. She was a sinner, it was free, and it lasts for eternity. It lasts forever. You can't lose it because if you think you can lose it, then you're trying to work for it and you're trying to keep it. You're trusting in yourself to keep it instead of trusting in Jesus who keeps it for us. All our trust and hope is in Jesus. And to explain that, it takes a little bit of time. It takes at least five to seven minutes, probably closer to seven minutes, to do a real thorough, adequate job. I mean, it's hard to get that done in three stanzas. People say, we're the thief on the cross. All he said was, Lord, remember me. And that doesn't take, you know, five to seven minutes. Well, yeah, but you don't know what kind of seeds were planted in that guy's heart prior to saying that. You don't know what Jesus had been talking to him about and preaching to him about and what kind of seeds. Look, I'd rather be too thorough, explain it, you know, go overboard with it, than not enough and have somebody thinking that, you know, they're still trusting their works or still, uh, you know, faith plus works or faith plus, you know, I could lose it. I'd rather take a little bit too much time and you can't, get, you're not going to be able to do a thorough job explaining the gospel to somebody, in my opinion, at a public invitation. All right. Number three, the reason why I will never do it is because it adds about 10 to 15 minutes to a service. All right. And not only, people get tired of hearing the same thing every Sunday, three times, or every, most, lots, some people, sometimes three times a week. You would get tired of hearing me give the same invitation that would take, and would add 10 to 15 minutes to our service. And I say the same thing, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday for 15 years. You get tired of it. All right? And it adds about 15, like I say, sometimes I add 10 to 15 minutes to the service. So here's how we do our invitation, what I believe is the most effective way. I'm not trying to be some know-it-all here. I'm just saying I think from my experience, what I've been in the churches that I've visited, this is what I think works the best. I, and I've been to several churches where I actually had somebody come up to me and do this. Because I was a visitor. All right, here's how, our invita how we do our invitation, what I believe is the most effective way. I approach visitors after the service personally. And I also have asked men in our church and women in our, ladies in our church to be on the lookout for visitors. Every visitor that visits our church should have me or one of them uh, appro be, uh, approach, me or one of the men or one of the ladies I've designated, to approach these visitors and basically say, you know, hey, how you doing? My name's Brother Curtis. So glad you came. We're, we're excited for you to be our visitor. Hope you'll come back and visit with us sometime. <clears throat> sir, I try to ask all of our visitors this very important question. God forbid, sir, but if you died today, are you 100% sure you'd be going to heaven? I've trained a couple ladies in our church to be on the lookout for lady visitors. All right, so that's how we're doing it. That way we can take our time. There's no rush, there's no pressure, you're, there's, no, there's no awkwardness being up in front of everybody, you know, worrying about, is everybody looking at me? Uh, that's our way. I'm not against people who don't do it our way, but that's what I, I think is best. We do an invitation, we just do a private invitation. All right, now, I do, if we, if we have any big date now in the future, what I want to do is I want to have a couple big days. 
to where we have a bring a friend day, probably do a bring a friend day every year, probably do a, uh, a turkey giveaway around Thanksgiving when we can get a lot of lost people here. And I'll preach a salvation message, one, you know, a couple times a year. I'll try to, try to do a salvation message. And um, then I probably will do some type of public invitation, but it won't be coming forward. It'll just be presenting the gospel to them, and they can pray in their seats. You know, instead of having to feel like they got to come forward in front of a bunch of people. But <clears throat> that's my whole philosophy. That's my opinion on the deal. And another thing about altars is they're done away with. <laughs> we don't sacrifice animals anymore. Altars were done away with, okay? Some say well, say, well, we have an altar so you can present your body a living sacrifice. That's not how you present your body a living sacrifice, my friend. You present your body a living sacrifice when it's soul winning time. All right? Because I've seen a lot of people come to the altar but never go soul winning. You want to present your body a living sacrifice? Then let's go soul winning. All right? <clears throat> Now, the first point was doctrines of men. I believe that, you know, again, it's not a big deal if people, churches want to do that. It's, I'm not saying it's sinful. I just don't believe it's effective. The only time I believe it would be sinful is when you actually preach it as if the Bible teaches it, because it doesn't. All right? <clears throat> if you want to say, you know, it's my preference, I like doing it this way, then that's nothing wrong with that. All right? <clears throat> the point number two I want to talk to you about is the death penalty. Turn to Leviticus chapter 20, verse 9. These are just two major points that I wanted to hit on this chapter, touch on this chapter. I could spend a whole service on this, but we've talked a lot about it lately, so I'm just going to touch on it real quick. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 9. Now, remember Jesus said they laid aside and rejected the commandment of God for the tradition of men. You remember I said how important it was to notice that he said twice, you have laid aside the commandment of men. Uh, or come, I'm sorry, you've laid aside the commandment of God for the tradition of men. Jesus said they have laid aside and rejected the commandment of God for the tradition of men. Two different times in, two different, in, in that same passage of Scripture. Now let's look at what commandment he was talking about. What commandment was Jesus referring to? Leviticus 20 verse 9, For everyone that curseth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death, he hath cursed his father or his mother. His blood shall be upon him. Here again we see Jesus Christ is standing and preaching Old Testament Levitical law in the New Testament, just like John the Baptist was in chapter 6. All right, John the Baptist said he was, he was preaching against King Herod and said, if a man, and from Leviticus, where it says, And if a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. He hath uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless. John the Baptist was railing on Herod for his unlawful, unlawful marriage. And John was preaching from Leviticus. He was referencing a, a law from Leviticus in the New Testament. And now we see Jesus doing it. Jesus is doing the exact same thing, preaching Old Testament moral law from Leviticus. Now, elsewhere, we saw Jesus preaching ceremonial laws. All right, in Mark 1, Jesus healed a leper and said, Go show yourself to the priest and offer, for a, for, offer a sacrifice for cleansing. Now, this was something that would uh, be done away with in a few years because the ceremonial laws were dealt to the cross. All those ceremonial laws were a shadow and a picture of what Jesus would do when he came. He nailed all those ceremonial laws to the cross. But look, this moral law that Jesus is referencing here about stoning these disobedient, or I'm sorry, uh, stoning these teenagers that would dishonor and curse their mother and father was not a Ceremonial law, it's a moral law that we should still be practicing today. I'll prove that to you here in a minute. But these moral laws that John the Baptist was referencing in chapter 6, these moral laws that Jesus is bringing up here of Leviticus were to establish good order and discipline for a civilization. Good law and order. Okay, Jesus' death on the cross did nothing to fulfill the need for good law and order in our nation and our society. Nothing. 
Everybody that Leviticus says should be executed in Leviticus chapter 20, we should still be executing today. Even these, uh, disobe- these teenagers. I keep wanting to say disobedient, but they weren't disobedient. All right? They were, they were teens that would hurt and harm their mother and father. Jesus was for the death penalty. I'm sorry. You know, no, I'm not sorry. This keeps coming up. I didn't plan it this way. I'm just trying to preach through Mark. All right? Jesus was for the death penalty. That's why he referred back to this commandment twice. And every time you bring up the death penalty to a Christian, without fail, you'll hear them refer back to the woman caught in adultery. Without fail. Ye that are without sin cast the first stone. I've been over this numerous times. I'm not going to go back into it. But the bottom line is, Jesus did not want to have her stoned. Okay, the same reason we wouldn't have a, an adulterer stoned who came to our church. It's not our job. It's not our job to take the law in our own hands. It's the government's job. All right? It's, the reason, it's one of the main reasons why Jesus said you without sin cast the first stone, and I've gone into a lot of other detail, how it was a setup, how it was a trap, and I've gone into a lot of other detail. If Jesus would have said, stone her, he would have been violating Roman law. If he would have said, don't stone her, he would have been violating Moses' law. All right, so it was a trap, it was a setup. Bottom line is, it's not our job to take the law in our own hands. It is our job to preach and teach what the government should be doing, though. All right? People say, well, I've committed adultery one time also, so should I be put to death? Yea, but look, you wouldn't have committed adultery if we'd have been practicing God's law because you'd have been too scared, you would have gotten caught, and you would have never done it. All right? And also, you know, people want to say, okay, well, what if we started stoning, what if we... What if we started enforcing God's laws and rules in our society? What about my past sins, my past crimes? Look, it would never happen. But let's say, God forbid, we just scrapped all the stinking man-made bogus laws, all the Obamacare and all that kind of trash. So many stinking man-made laws, you couldn't fit them in this house. If we just scrapped all that nonsense and said, we're going by this law, this is all we need because the law of the Lord is perfect, If we said we're just going to go by this law and we're going to start holding God's moral and criminal laws and people's feet to the fire and holding them accountable and executing rapists and homosexuals and adulterers and kidnappers and teens who would harm their mother and father, if we started doing that, you wouldn't have to, you wouldn't be, it wouldn't be punishable what you did prior to the enactment of that law. It'd be like, okay, from this day forward, any adulterers shall be put to death. You wouldn't be, be able to be held, held guilty for something you did when it wasn't a law. All right? And, and people always want to say this, too. Well, you know, if we were going to commit, you know, if we were going to execute adulterers, then we'd all have to be executed. Because we're all adulterers. <laughs> Who's ever heard that? Well, here's the deal. They, they want to say, well, we've all committed adultery in our hearts by thinking it. Look, th- this is not real complicated. Thinking it is a sin. Doing it is a crime. There's a difference there, okay? Big difference. Romans 1 says, they that commit such things are worthy of death. It didn't say they that think such things are worthy of death. All right? <clears throat> Why do you keep bringing this up? Again, I didn't bring it up as a Mark chapter 7, and I'm not going to skip over it because it's not popular. I'm not going to skip over this. I think this is the perfect Word of God. No errors. Can't be improved upon. And some say, you think it's the perfect Word of God even when it talks about stoning children? Now look, it's not talking about little kids here. Let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 18 to see exactly who this is talking about. If we had to stone disobedient children, there'd be no children walking the face of the earth. (laughs) All right? Now, the Obamas of the world, the the Bible haters of the world, 
the Obamas of the world, they want to ridicule Jesus and His Word by making fun of doctrine like this. Look it up on YouTube sometime. Just type in, Obama mocks the Bible. This is before he was even a president. He says, what part, of the, what part of the Bible should we allow to dictate public policy? Should it be stoning disobedient children? But does it say anywhere in the Bible to stone a disobedient child? No. He says, or should it be slavery? Should we allow slavery? He doesn't understand biblical slavery. All right, he takes that, he takes that out of context and he mocks and belittles and he's prideful and arrogant, thinks he knows more than God himself. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 18. Let's see what's going on here. Let's see if this is actually stoning disobedient children Jesus is talking about here. I make no apologies for the word of God. Obama can say what he wants to say. Make no apologies for the word of God. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 18. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother and that when they have chastened him will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and shall bring him out into the elders of, the city, of his city and into the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of his city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He's a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shall thou put evil away from among you. And all Israel shall hear and fear. This is a fear tactic to get teenagers Rear ends and gear. Amen? Now this is not some little disobedient child here. Alright, this was the case. We'd have to execute all of them. This is, this, is, this is a person who's wicked enough to be a drunk, who's old enough to be a drunkard. This is some wicked, lazy, good-for-nothing teen who will not hearken to his parents' punishment. He's being chastised over and over and over again and nothing's working. He's cursing his parents. He's wanting to harm them. He's probably even hitting them. Okay? He wants to do them harm. And look, if our government would execute this kind of person, you think of all the rapists and the mass murderers and the burdens on our society that this would eliminate. <clears throat> and the good thing is it would, curtail, it would curtail this type of behavior. All of America shall hear and fear. You want to you uh, see our teens straighten up and fly right? Let's, let's hang one of these sorry, stinking teens. That would, let's hang one of these teenagers that would hit his mother. Let's hang him and hang him and let him hang and dangle until his, his body separates from his neck. And let's see them straighten up a bunch of teenagers. Let's see how soon we'll, we'll solve and we'll fix this, this, this treatment of, of teens hitting their parents. All right? And the thing is, you don't have to do it about once every 50 years. And, you know, all you'd have to do is take a YouTube video of it. And, you know, you just have to sit your teenagers down and let them watch that YouTube video of it. And it'd be good for 100 years, probably. You know, you wouldn't have to do it very often. Uh, you know, all mom and dad would have to do is sit down and let them watch the video. And they'd straighten up real quick. Guaranteed. All right? And there was a... There was a there was a, a process that they had to be adjudicated. Okay? They had to be, they had to, the evidence had to be examined, what they were doing. The elders wouldn't require just somebody who just, you know, just maybe said a cuss word to their mom and dad. No, this was a wicked, evil, lazy, sorry, drunk who wanted to harm their parents. And look, here, <clears throat> I make no apologies for the book, friend. I hold in my hands the perfect word of God cannot be improved upon better than any constitution the world has ever thought of. Better than any constitution the world has ever created. Amen. Perfect law of liberty. I love it and I, I, I want to do my best at following and living by it with God's help, with God's grace. Best constitution ever written. Can't be improved upon, my friend. Don't make any apologies for this word. Don't hang, your, don't hang your head in shame when the atheists and the Richard Dawkins and the Obamas of the world attack our Bible because they're attacking the God that wrote the Bible. Amen? Let's love it. Let's live by it. 
Let's try our best to follow it. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for all of our many blessings, Lord. Thank you, thank you for your precious word, your precious law of liberty. Lord, I, I, we just wish our society would get back to it. Lord, we wish our society would stop trusting in their man-made traditions and laws and bogus rules and, and just get back to the perfect law of liberty so we can have some real freedom and we can have some real liberty in our, in our, in our nation. Lord, please help us to get back to this book, Lord. And if, and if, and if our, and I doubt America's ever going to get back to it, but we can, we can at least stand on it. We can at least preach it. We can at least do our best to live by it and try to tell others about it. We love you now, Lord. Please go before us and help us to keep somebody out of hell. In Jesus' name, amen. Hymn number five.